the 10th chapter is called as vibhuti yoga now it has two distinct parts the first part is where krishna builds up his teachings of bhakti till he comes to the chaturshloki gita and then arjuna responds to that and after that krishna moves on to actually address the concept of vibhuti based on what he has So he continues the teachings of the of bhakti, which is started in the ninth chapter, and he says that Krishna, I'll tell you, Arjuna, I'll tell you again. And his focus in this chapter is on how a devotion to him, service to him, is not a matter of sentiment. And if you understand his position, that he is the source of everything, he is the source of all virtues in this world. He is, Krishna talks about how he is the source in terms of history and in terms of quality. In terms of history, that means he says that he, he is the original progenitor. All living beings come from him. And he gives a sequence, some tells a description of genealogy. Genealogy is basically the descent over generations and then he talks about how qualities all qualities ultimately come from him and in this way when we understand that everything that is of value that comes from him then the result of that will be there will be absorption there is not just absorption but absorption with conviction that Krishna is the highest reality, that there is no reality other than Krishna. So, in, so the idea is that it is good to be absorbed in Krishna, but it is better to be absorbed in Krishna with conviction. So, let's look at a few of the verses, what Krishna says in the seventh verse. So, he gives a list of various qualities and he gives a list of how the various beings came across the universe and then eta e, e, all this vibhutim vibhutim is the opulence the greatness the great thing in this world yogam cha in this way in this way you understand that all these great things are there in the world and that they are all connected with me mama yo vetti one who knows is about tattvataha many times krishna talks about this theme of knowing him in truth tattvataha there can be sentimental knowing also, but whether it's philosophical knowing, there is knowing in truth, then the result is different. Etam, etam vibhutim yogam cha. Etam vibhutim yogam cha. Mama yo vetti tattvataha. Mama yo vetti tattvataha. So, such a person, avikalpena yogi, no. So, the word yoga is twice. First, he is talking about God's connection with us, yogam. In this way, when you see that everything is connected with me, then the second yogena is our connection with God. That we will connect with God, avikalpena. Vikalpa means alternative. So, without considering any alternatives, we will wholeheartedly connect with Him. Yujyate, will engage in the practice of yoga. Na atra, about this, samshaya, there is no doubt. So generally Krishna ta has talked about how if you practice bhakti or if you remember me at the time of death, you will come to me. About that there is no doubt. But here he is not saying that you will come to me. He says that if you do this, your mind will come to me. Your mind will stay with me. Your mind will not go anywhere else. So it is often philosophical conviction that strongly aids devotion. Sometimes people say that bhakti is just a matter of sentiment. 
know, you just, those people who are too sentimental, they practice bhakti. But here Krishna is saying that, yes, people who are sentimental can practice bhakti also. But those who come with philosophical conviction, they will stay steadily, their mind will not wander. So, vikalpena yogena, so vikalpena yogena, yujyate natra samshaya, yujyate natra samshaya. So, together, etam vibhuti yogamcha, mama yogeti tattvata, so vikalpena yogena, yujyate natra samshaya. So, Let's try to understand this process. That is, there is conviction, which is broadly of the intelligence. Then conviction that will bring concentration of the mind. Without conviction, the concentration will depend on emotion, sentiment. Hey, sometimes this feel good, I will focus. When I'm full book, why do I need to focus? So when there is conviction, then will concentration. And when there is concentration, this way, eventually, it will lead to purification. And after that purification will come absorption. So, I discussed earlier about how concentration is more effortful. Absorption is effortless. So now, many times, when we try to focus on Krishna, if we just try, say, sometimes we have some japa remaining, just pick up the beat and start chanting. And of course, we have less time, so it's natural that we want to finish our prescribed chanting. But then the problem at that time may be that we have not really reinforced our conviction. Is there something I have to get done? And then we'll find the mind will wander a lot. So if you just take a few deep breaths, maybe recite some words about the glories of the holy name or recite some, try to remember the past time of Krishna, maybe read some quote, just give our intelligence some food. Because we give the intelligence some food, that then the intelligence will have the energy to refocus the mind when it goes off. So Krishna, as far as hearing regularly and remembering what we have heard, at least some things, that will so become a pain a yogi. You know. By understanding Krishna's glories, we can we will we can focus on Krishna wholeheartedly. So how will it happen? A vikalpena. How does conviction lead to greater concentration? Because conviction essentially means and it is Krishna who is the substance. And everything else is ultimately insubstantial. That doesn't mean it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter all that much. You know, today I have this problem, this person said this to me, I have to meet that deadline, that person said that, and so many things going on. But we realize that every day something or the other is going to be there. So there's no need to get so worked up about it. Now, after this, Krishna will summarize his teachings. So these four verses that come after this are called as the Chatur Shloki Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita summarized in four verses. Let's look at those four verses now, one by one. So first, Krishna will talk about the principle of attraction. That how can we become attracted to him? So, Aham Sarvasya Prabhu. Everything comes from me. Mattaha Sarva Pravartati. Everything is sustained by me. In me, everything is sustained. So that is the idea of God as the creator and the God as the controller. Not just God as source the universe and God is no longer there. Aham sarvasya prabhavo Aham sarvasya prabhavo Mattaha sarvam pravartate Mattaha sarvam pravartate Iti matva Iti matva means understanding this. Bhajante ma One starts worshipping. How? Buddha Bhava Samanyutaha. Buddha, such is a person wise. And then Bhava is emotion. Samanyuta are enriched with emotion. So there is this beautiful combination of the heart and the head over here. With which one is worshipping the Lord. 
इति मत्वा भजन्ते माम इति मत्वा भजन्ते माम बुधा भाव समन्वितः बुधा भाव समन्वितः सो सो वेल नोन वर्स सो विल ट्राई टू लुक एट दीस फोर वर्सेस इन अ सीक्वेंस टू अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट इज गोइंग ऑन ओवर हियर सो द फर्स्ट थिंग कृष्णा सेज इज दैट कृष्णा ब्रॉडली टॉक्स अबाउट the first thing is attraction now what does it mean how does knowledge of krishna lead to whole hearted devotion to him say if some kid is grown up in a poor or a mediocre middle class family and that kid comes to know actually i have been ado- adopted and my parents are actually like kings they are millionaires they are billionaires they are trillionaires then if they actually come to know that what would you want to do you want to reconnect with them naturally you want to connect to the parents if they are even if they are not well to do but if they are well to do all the more so so like that the idea is if we come to know about krishna then that will create a longing for him a whole hearted devotion to him so knowledge of krishna that <coughs> is not just information it has to be transformation in the sense that this knowledge should actually bring about some significant change in our lives it's take as an example if somebody comes to know that in the backyard of our house buried is some huge treasure some jewels are there Okay, nice, interesting information. What else is there new? No, if you come to the oh, all, go and take and get that treasure, isn't it? So it is the knowledge which should be calling us to action. That's why the idea of God, if we don't make it relational, oh, God is some being existing somewhere up there. No, God is Surudam Sarva Bhutana. He is our greatest well-wisher. He wants the best for us. why would we not connect with a powerful person who wants the best for us we all want to grow in our lives so imagine now if uh, you want to you want to get a job you want to do some internship you want to do some studies and you need some recommendation from a professor and now you try to develop we try to develop a relationship with that particular professor mm-hmm. and then we try to do something for that person then they then we can get a recommendation but if we came to know that oh actually that professor is interested in us for whatever reason maybe that professor is related is some distant relative of us or the professor has heard of us, of us from somewhere and is interested us. then we would be so much eager isn't it somebody is powerful and influential and wants to help us why would we stay away from such a person so to know krishna so knowledge of krishna it has many specific details of krishna performed this past time krishna performed that past time but it is to know krishna as two distinct aspects to know his position and to know his disposition to know his position means that he has power supreme power but not just power but he has supreme power and not only has supreme power he also has supreme care for us he he has power and he has care why do we not want to just connect connect with such a person so that is the first words if you understand krishna then will naturally be attracted to you we are eager to connect so <clears throat> the next words talks about association and this was is talking about association in a very interesting way it is not talking about association association has plays many many roles one level is association is it like it starts our spiritual journey and generally when we could get good association that's when we start practicing bhakti so that is true but in this particular verse krishna is talking about how 
association makes the spiritual journey both enjoyable and enlightening enjoyable and enlightening let's look at this so most of us know this verse i'll just explain the meaning and then we'll decide it much with my the consciousness fixed on me proper translate this sometimes very beautifully as not just as they fix their thoughts on me but it's like that i am the home of their thoughts their thoughts find their home in me so our thoughts may go in 100 directions like we may go in various places for our work but wherever we go at the end we come back home so like that their thoughts reside in me proper says so our thoughts when we are functioning in the world we have to think about many things think about our job our health our career our relationships but as soon as that is done krishna should be around we come back to krishna so mat chitta mat gata prana that their whole life is devoted to me and then bodhayanta so krishna is talking about basically when we are dedicated to someone sanyasis for example have three dandas then you know what those th- the three dandi sanyasi the three dandas they combine together what is it mind body mind body and words mind body and words so krishna is going to talk about those three things the mind mat chitta mat gata prana means their whole life that is in their life in the body their body is devoted to mat gata prana and then it's interesting krishna a friend spends almost three lines out of the four lines describing the tongue what they do with it bodhayantah parasparam they it's not just they talk with each other it is they enlighten each other so now the important thing is each other parasparam so this is not krishna talking about guru speaking to a disciple bodhayantah hmm? parasparam and now it's also interesting that krishna has already said in the previous words that these people are buddha buddha means they are enlightened so how can the enlightened enlighten each other are they already enlightened <laughs> but krishna says bodhayantah parasparam and what is the nature of this enlightenment kathayantah chinmamrityam they discuss constantly my glories and tushyanti cha ramanti cha now uh, tushyanti means satisfied ramanti means delighted while both of them are positive emotions they are different degrees of positive emotions isn't it say now if we have a nice meal oh i'm satisfied somebody wants to serve us more say i'm satisfied and i'm really i'm satisfied i'm happy but say if we if in the meal there is our favorite delicacy that is made then you would say i'm satisfied If somebody knows and they knows that it's our favorite delicacy and they go out of their way they will make it then will we be satisfied it's much more than satisfied isn't it i'm delighted if we make if somebody makes our favorite delicacy and he says i'm satisfied yeah, they will not be satisfied by that expression <laughs> <laughs> there's a degrees and it's much greater than that is tushyanti is contentment ramanti is delight joy so it's degrees of happiness this is the idea of anandam buddhi vartan there are degrees of joy in the remembrance of krishna so let's recite this verse and then i'll elaborate on the bodhayanta mat chitta together we can do it most of the words mat chitta mat gata prana bodhayanta parasparam kathayantascha maam nityam tushyanti cha ramanti cha yes so here <coughs> Krishna is talking about association in this terms in ten point ten, sorry ten point nine. Now when he is talking about it, what does he mean? How can the enlightened be enlightened? So the Buddha, how can they be bodhayanta? Because enlightenment is both a destination. and a journey so how can it be both 
you know, either I have got to my destination or on my journey. But it's destination in terms of our understanding who is supremely lovable, who is the supreme object of love. Where should I be directing my heart's emotion and affection? Oh, enlightenment means to understand that it is Krishna who is the supreme object of love. In that sense, our, our heart, our head, our consciousness, it goes in hundreds of directions. Oh, you know, I may love cricket, I may love my, uh, some life partner, I may love wealth, I may love my country, I may love so many things. And after that, I understand the supremely lovable reality is Krishna. That in that sense, enlightenment is a journey, but is a destination at the end of a journey. But after that, what happens is how lovable Krishna is. That is an ongoing discovery all the time. So. We always keep coming to know how wonderful Krishna is. And in that sense, the enlightenment goes on. So to understand this, let's consider one metaphor. Say this is an ocean. This ocean is basically Krishna or Krishna's glories. So now if we talk about the ocean as Krishna's glories, then one person may come to the ocean from here. Now they could have gone in this direction, this direction, this direction. So because they come to Krishna, they have come to the end of the, they are enlightened in that sense. Hmm? That they have come to the ocean. But, say, one person has come to the ocean from here, another person has come to the ocean from here. Now what happens is, while in the same ocean, it is actually, the, it is the ocean of nectar and the nectar has slightly different flavors at different places. And then when the two of them, they have both hayantaha, they both can enlighten each other about how wonderful Krishna is. Because Krishna is a person and we know him in a relationship. So, in a relationship, I, I will experience Krishna from a particular perspective. You will experience Krishna from a particular perspective. And then both of us can relish that. And both of us can learn more about our Lord. So that's why even the enlightened keep getting further enlightened. And that's the joy of their life. To know more and more and more about Krishna. So, if we see enlightenment only as a destination, well, this is an important point to understand how things work. If you think enlightenment only as a destination, then what happens is that breeds an unhealthy certainty. And this can very easily lead to fanaticism. <coughs> I know, and anybody who doesn't agree to me, that person is a deviant. That person is destined to go to hell. That person is Kali Chela. That person is actually an agent of Kali, contaminating and deviating our movement. So, if we think I have got to the destination of enlightenment, that's the only thing we think about. So, it's a two extremes. If it's only an unlike destination, then in spiritual circles, a certain amount of humility is vital. Nobody can claim, I know Krishna. In many religious organizations, often fights happen among the members of the organizations because both argue, my understanding of the teacher, my understanding of the text is the only right understanding. And because of that, people fight. There are so many denominations among with, among which people fight. And Christians, there are Catholics. You know what is the other group? Protestants. Protestants. Okay. So those of you know, they will get this point. So they often have their own fights. So the Protestants don't have either monks or nuns. 
but uh, catholics have both so now once a girl who had grown up in a nunnery she told uh, her her guide in the, the elder nun hello so now that you have, what do you want to what, what do you want to become after you grow up now so she said i want to become a prostitute what what did you say she said i want to become a prostitute oh thank god i thought you wanted to become a protestant <laughs> so sometimes theological differences can small theological differences can become far bigger than major moral differences you know if somebody is becoming as somebody grew up in nunnery she become prostitute that's a terrible thing but no 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 worse is if you become a protestant so it's no we shouldn't lose so, there is if this fanaticism is you know it's a, such a pettiness it's petty things small things are made very big and this is not just to make fun of christianity every religious tradition has this you know there is one one may big temple in south india there were two groups of even vaishnavas itself and one of the so in the temple they would have a elephant and the elephant would go on the uh, the deities would go on the elephant the two groups of vaishnavas and they had difference about the shape of the tilak that was the right tilak and then one group said that the elephant has to be worn tilak like this only and the elephant has to be worn tilak like this only and then that conflict became so nasty that both sides this went on and on and eventually they couldn't resolve it so they went to the court an indian court system where they went from the local court they were not satisfied with the decision they went all the way to the supreme court and it was it is a poetic justice you could say the day the supreme court gave the decision that day the elephant died <laughs> <laughs> so because of that difference that elephant was not used only they stopped the procession for the law now okay yeah tilak tilak matters but you know does it can you be so certain and uh, this is the only right thing the slight difference you are a deviant hello well, okay there are simple solutions could be there in one group in the now of course this is complicated history but my point is that an unhealthy certainty can be toxic can be fanatic now on the other hand if you consider enlightenment only to be a journey then there can be an unhealthy uncertainty Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, you think Krishna is supreme? Yeah, maybe Krishna is supreme for you. Somebody else thinks the impersonal is supreme. Yeah, the impersonal is supreme for them. And somebody else thinks there is no God. Okay, that's you also right. It is yato mat tato pat. Uh, this is a. Uh, it's like God is a. Uh, there are some. T- say there are some quotes which stimulate the intelligence, but they don't take the intelligence anywhere. So there's one Maya Vadi. He says that God is like a circle. Circumference is everywhere, but center is nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> What does it mean? <laughs> it just doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The soul is like a circle, whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere. <laughs> so basically people say actually this is just a journey and just enjoy the journey there is this is a journey spirituality the idea is spiritually a journey with no destination if it's only a journey then what happens is it just leads to relativism relativism is ah uh, what is right for you is right for you what is right for me is right for me now in terms of people having the right to believe what they want to do that's fine but that does not mean every belief right the uh, right to believe we can respect you can believe whatever you want krishna doesn't legislate belief hmm? people can right to believe is okay but that's different from cl- claiming that it is a right belief they are two different things 
So now when you understand that enlightenment is both the journey and the destination. You know, that brings on one side humility. There is much that I don't know. But at another point, it also, at another side, it also brings clarity. It's not that everything is uncertain. There are certain bedrock truths that are absolutely there. Those truths cannot be compromised. If they are relativized, there is nothing left. If somebody says, oh, whether we are the soul or the body, it doesn't matter. Well, if you start thinking that doesn't matter, then it's like it's people who think nothing matters, then they don't matter after some time. Their life doesn't matter. If if somebody says nothing matters, you can say that your opinion doesn't matter, you know, right? Like that. This leaves them at a distance. So there's clarity as well as humility. This is the idea of enlightenment as both a journey and a destination. Now after that, Krishna says that when there's, there's like this enlightening each other about me. Now, when we are in this world, this world can put the best of us in trouble. And we can face challenges to our faith. So, how do I see this particular situation? So, if we're in association, Devotees can guide us. Okay, okay, you know, this we are facing this particular problem. Okay, see, we may have conviction in Krishna's glories. That Krishna is God, Krishna is in charge. But what does Krishna want me to do in this situation? So basically, Prabhupada writes that a devotee is never <coughs> discouraged. Because a devotee always has faith, Krishna is my well wisher. A devotee is never discouraged because a devotee says Krishna is in charge of my life. But he says devotee can be perplexed. Perplexed means what does Krishna want me to do? I had a particular plan for my life. That plan is not working or everything about that plan has just gone off. So even Prabhupada worked extremely hard to try to build his business so that he could contribute to his Guru's mission. Now, if we consider uh, Prabhupada, he was, was born in Kolkata, then he came to Mumbai and then he was in Prayag. Yeah, Prayag. Now, if you see, these are quite long distances. Then he moved his family. One of my friends has studied the history of the India in the 1920s, 30s, quite in detail. So I talked with him. He said, this kind of movement was not very common, especially for business people. People who would work in the government, the government would move them, the government would provide them quarters, and they would move. But for a person to move the entire business to a different place, it was not common. The, the point I'm making is Prabhupada tried very hard to uh, to build his business so that he could support his guru's mission but it just didn't work and, and, and again and again his business faced reversals and that's when he talked with one of his god brothers and uh, Prabhupada himself read that verse yes, manukranami those on whom Krishna says I show special mercy I take everything away from them that way they have nothing and no one except me to depend on. And Prabhupada felt as if this was speaking to him. And I talked to his god brother. And I said, yes. He said that you know, when our Guru Maharaj passed away, when the mission got fractured at the Odia Mat, then I also felt something similar. And this is your time. Yes, Krishna is giving you special mercy. So it is Bodhayantaha Parasparam. So when we are perplexed, what happens is, when we are perplexed, we need guidance. And that guidance can come from outside and that's described in 10.9. And it can come from inside. That's described in 10.10. 10. 
That's the worst way we could discuss. That the guidance can come from both places. So why do the enlightened keep needing to enlighten each other? Because we may be enlightened about that Krishna is God. But how does Krishna want me to serve here right now? Let us say, for example, for all of us, you know, should I take this job or that job? Should I enter this ashram or that ashram? Should I do this service or that service? Our life may be centered on serving Krishna, but still, there will be perplexity for us. So, outside and inside. Out, outside means we talk with devotees and Krishna is not saying here just go to Guru and take instruction about your life Krishna says from the Guru take instructions about the nature of ultimate reality but often our Guru may not be available so there has to be proper discussion so and then inside inside is what we will be discussing not time so in this particular verse Krishna will talk about this Inner guidance. Tesham Satata Yuktana. Those who are in this way constantly engaged in my service. That means their life is centered on my service. Vajitam. And how? Preeti Purvakam. We'll talk about this a little later, but it's very important. With affection. That means when things go wrong in our life, if we become bitter, we become resentful, nothing ever works, then that bitterness blocks Krishna's voice from coming in. So, Bhajitam Preeti Purvakam. Tadami, for those people, Buddhi Yogam Tam, I will give you the intelligence by which Ye Nama Upayanti Te, they can come to me. Te Shaam Satat, together. Te Shaam Satat Yukta Naam, Bhajitam Preeti Purvakam, Tadami Buddhi Yogam Tam, so let's look at three, uh, two word, key words from this. This is 10.10. Let's first focus on Buddhi Yoga. Now, what is this Buddhi Yoga? See, at one level, some people often ask when they read the Bhagavad Gita carefully, is Buddhi Yoga is the fourth kind of yoga. Is Karma Yoga, Dhyan Yoga, Gyan Yoga, is there Buddhi Yoga another kind of Yoga? Well, not exactly. Buddhi Yoga can broadly mean two things. Buddhi to do Yoga. Hmm? Buddhi to do Yoga. Hmm? And the other is Yoga that gives Buddhi. So, now Krishna himself uses the word Buddha Yoga at many different places. In 2.38 when he uses the 2.39 Esha te abhita sankhe buddhir yoga etva imam shunu So there he uses it in this first sense. The buddhi to do yoga. And in this context Krishna is referring to it says karma yoga. So that is what is going on in the second chapter. So it can be, okay, once I understand an Atma, I understand that I should not be bound in this world. I need to get out. Therefore, with that buddhi, I practice yoga. I practice karma yoga. That's when it is used in that context. I mean, 10.10 10 when Krishna is using it. He says, Dadami buddhi yogam tam yena maam upayanti te. So here, actually, I will give you buddhi yoga by which you can come to me. So here what it means is, Krishna is giving something, XYZ, by which you can come to him. So what is it? It is intelligence. Now, this, in this context, actually both meanings are possible. It is like buddhi to do yoga. Because we are able to come to Krishna by doing, by what Krishna gives us. So it is buddhi to do yoga. So it can be, be buddhi that with me with you to yoga. But then another point over here is that it can also refer to before that what is one is doing? Tesham Padat Yuktana Bhajatam Priti Purva. That is already yoga, isn't it? So it can also refer to the yoga that gives buddhi. Now what does this mean basically? That bhakti has a very dynamic relationship with buddhi. And understanding that is very helpful. 
So sometimes devotees ask that when we surrender, should we surrender our intelligence or should we surrender with our intelligence? You understand the difference to that? When we surrender, should we surrender our intelligence? Okay, I don't know anything. I am a fool, you please enlighten me. And there is an example of that. Who is that? Sanatan Goswami, Murkami. I don't know. Kami, I don't know anything. So we surrender our intelligence, but the other is we surrender with our intelligence. <coughs> now, if you see in that same conversation, Sanatan Goswami says this. Eventually, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu starts speaking to him, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu doesn't treat him like a fool. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives him elevated philosophical knowledge. And, and whom can you give elevated philosophical knowledge? Who already has basic philosophical knowledge, isn't it? So, so it's not literal that we just reject or abandon our intelligence. No. We surrender with our intelligence. So the principle is that in bhakti, we do, we just, our focus is on service. And in general, <coughs> When we are serving, we should use all the intelligence that we have. Why has God given us a gift if not to use it? But, so you could say, normal is that we surrender with our intelligence. We use all our intelligence, we try to figure out, we try to analyze, we try to reason. We surrender with our intelligence. But this is in normal situations. But there can be exceptional situations. And in exceptional situations, one has to surrender their intelligence. So in the middle of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna was in the middle of the Kurukshetra battlefield, Arjuna was confused. And he asked, he asked Krishna various questions and he understood the answers. So he was surrendering to Krishna, but with his intelligence. He was using his intelligence to understand the message, and that's how he was surrendering. That's how, at the end, he came to the point of surrendering to Krishna. Now, on the 14th day, when Arjuna had taken a vow that I will reach Jayadrath before death, before night, before the sun sets, otherwise, I will go on the path of death. So Arjuna fought like never before. And he broke through the Kaurava ranks and just came within touching distance. He could see Jaydrath's chariot's standard the flag. And within a few moments he would be there and he would destroy Jaydrath. But at that time, Duryodhan deployed eight warriors to attack Arjuna simultaneously. Drona and Kripa attack from one side, Ashwatthama and Karana attack from another side, Duryodhana and Dushas and Jal attack from another side, and then Vishalya and Kutavarman attack from another side. And Arjuna was just surrounded by arrows. He couldn't even see ahead, leave alone move ahead. Just whirling around his bow and shooting arrows and keeping all the arrows at bay. But while he was doing it, the sun started sinking. And Arjuna started this feeling despair. So close, yet so far. So at that time, Krishna noticed his friend's predicament and he decided to help. Krishna summoned his Sudarshan Chakra. Within a moment, nobody even noticed. And then he sent his Sudarshan Chakra to cover the sun. And when the sun got covered, suddenly everybody stopped fighting. And the Kaurava started cheering. Hey, Arjuna, you are defeated. <coughs> Jaydrath had been hiding behind. So, you know, he said, hey, you are going to kill me? Should I light your funeral pyre now? And Arjuna was dejected. He started lowering his bow. And Krishna spoke in an urgent voice. Arjuna, there is still time. So, point your bow, arrow at, point your arrow at Jaydrath's head. And invoke the Brahmastra. Arjuna had questions. <laughs> he, real, he knew 
there is a time for asking questions and that time is not now <laughs> so he put the brahmastra and as he was about to shoot it krishna removed the sarasvati chakra krishna said there is jayendra so there is the sun and there is jayendra shoot <laughs> right in front of everyone's eyes i just shot and killed jayendra so the point i'm making is there are sometimes we have to surrender our intelligence but that is not the normal way arjuna fought arjuna fought throughout the battle by using his intelligence so even when krishna was with arjuna krishna was not micro controlling arjuna hey, you know sh shoot this warrior don't shoot this warrior no he was assisting arjuna in the fight but major strategic decisions krishna was there so why are we discussing about the surrender over here do we surrender with our intelligence or we surrender our intelligence see normally when we are practicing bhakti we use our intelligence as much as we can and we try to practice bhakti but at some times we will just not be able to figure out with our intelligence why is this happening what is going on over here so then what do we do then we maintain priti purvakam that is the important thing see normally what happens when there is lack of success especially after there is earnest effort earnest endeavor when i am doing everything i tried this i planned this I, i executed this and in spite of that there is lack of success then it's very easy to become bitter but krishna says don't become bitter stay positive stay affectionate bhajatam priti purvakam krishna you must have some plan for me i do not know what is your plan you must have some plan that right. see when prabhupad came to america in one sense he had a lifetime of failure behind now of course satsuru mahaj had written the first volume of the lamruti called it as a lifetime in preparation but if you look at the title you know who wants to spend a lifetime in preparation maybe 5 years in preparation 10 years in preparation 20 years in preparation a lifetime in preparation that's a bit too much so we could look at it another way and could say that oh prabhupada a lifetime of failure but those who met prabhupad even when he was just an unknown swami walking on the streets of new york the first thing that struck him was he was so happy he was just so happy talking about krishna chanting krishna's names writing about krishna he didn't have a need for fame he was not bitter and craving and resentful about the fact that he had not succeeded he wanted of course krishna's glory is to spread but he was content with himself and that's bhajat so prabhupad even at that time was doing bhajata priti purvakam so what happens is in our service there is external success and there is internal success now ideal is both come together so external success is our contribution what is it that we are trying to do in this world internal success is our connection so now external success may or may not be now may, may or may not come it is not in our control but inner success is it is largely in our control so for example when we say i try to speak about krishna the one people one person might come 10 people might come 100 people might come but we can still speak about krishna i mean we speak about krishna we will be illuminated by that we will feel enlightened by that now this is it is not it is largely beyond our control <coughs> so could say it's it's mostly in our control you can say it's not entirely in it's mostly beyond our control so this bhajatam priti purvakam means we focus on this when we focus on this then we will have priti purvakam krishna i am grateful 
for every opportunity to connect with you. And I connect with you and that I'm enriched. I want to share that enrichment with others. And I wanted to reach others, but I am also I'm myself enriched by this connection. So if we are doing Bhakti Priti Purvakam, then Krishna will give us ideas. Dhamami Bhutti Yoga. If this is not there, typically that we can be bitter, we can be resentful. Sometimes we can start feeling insecure, unworthy. Now, should we feel in bhakti, it's important that you know, humility is not insecurity. <coughs> hmm. Quite often we think that the opposite of ego is humility, but it's not that simple. Ego is on one side, insecurity is on the other side. And in between is humility. So ego is basically I can I'm I can do everything. Any service I can do, and I can be a, I can be a best devotee in that service. And then insecurity is I can do nothing. I am worthless. You know, I am so unqualified. I am. I am utterly worthless. But humility is, I can do some things. Let me find out what it is that I can do and let me do that. So Prabhupada would often say, find out something to do for Krishna and do it. So now of course, if we have senior devotees guiding us and giving us uh, insights about how to serve, that's a fortune. But Humility does not mean fixating, oh, I am useless, I am worthless. Humility means understanding that I am not God. But that also doesn't mean that I am nothing. See, we are Mamai Amsho Jeeva Loke. We are a part of Krishna. We are not the whole, but we are also nothing. We are also not, we are also not nothing. So. We are also not nothing. So, I can do something. So, it's like, I am a part of Krishna and that means this is a philosophical truth but what does it mean practically for us that means I have a part in Krishna's plan now what is the part for me that may take some time to find out say if somebody is selected in the Indian cricket team. Now, if they are selected in the Indian cricket team, whoever selected them will have some part for them. You know, okay, are you opening batsman? Are you an anchor batsman, a pinch hitter? Are you a fast baller, a spin baller, this, that? What is your role? Now, what is the specific role that we want to play? That may take some time to find out. But if we are a part of the team, that means we have a part in the team. So, we are, Krishna says, Sanatanaha. For that sanatana, we often use it on the philosophical level to say that oh, we don't merge into God. I mean, if you don't use it to refute my avat. That's helpful, but that sanatana can also be understood on a psychological level. That we are always parts of Krishna. No matter how many mistakes we have made, no matter how many conditionings we have, still we are parts of Krishna. And Krishna has a part for us. So if we have this, Bajatam Priti Purvakam. Then, what is my part? Krishna will reveal that part to me. Bajatam Priti Purvakam. So then, afterwards, Krishna says, the next thing, last verse is in the Chatushloki Gita. So, Buddhi Yogam Tam Yenamam Upayant. I'll give the Buddhi by which they can come to me. But, somebody may say that, okay, now I know this is the path I should do. But still, I have too many conditions which prevent me from doing it. See, one is, I don't have clarity about what I want to do. But I may have clarity about what I am meant to do, but I don't seem to have the ability to do it. I don't have the purity, I don't have whatever is required. For it. So the last verse is, Krishna says, I will provide that. So, Tesha Evanukam Partham. Evanu, certainly for those people, Anukampa. Anukampa is mercy. 
I will provide the means. Artham. And what will that do? Aham Agyana Jamtamaha. The darkness that has come from ignorance. That Nashayamya Atma Bhavastu. Krishna is saying, I am not far away from you. That you have to struggle all along this world and I am in the spiritual world and you have to come to me. He says, I am here with you. Atma Bhavastu. And I will destroy. Nashayamya. I will destroy the ignorance. Jnana Dibena Bhaswataha. Krishna will illumine the, the torchlight of knowledge within our heart and illuminate that heart. So let's recite this verse together. Tesham Evan Kampatham Aham Agyana Jamtama Nashayam Yatma Bhavastho Yana Dibena Bhaswata So here the point we made is Krishna will guide us. So the 10.10 and 10.11 they are very similar. Both are similar to the Krishna removes, Krishna removes ignorance. But there is a progression. 10.10 is about having clarity of what to do. 10.11 is having the purity. Having the ability to do it. So Krishna is saying, I will remove that. Aham Agyana Jantama. I will destroy that. Many of Srila Prabhupada's disciples have told this, and this is where you know, these two verses, especially, eh? and especially the last verse, is the idea of empowerment. When you say we are empowered, what does it mean? That something beyond us guides us, something beyond us energizes us. We become an instrument for Krishna. That Bhajatam Priti Purvakam means Krishna, I know you have some part for me. Please make me an instrument of your will. So when we try to become an instrument, then it is not just our intelligence, not our endeavor that is working through. It is Krishna who is working through us. It is Krishna who is guiding us. And Krishna will empower us. So basically, these verses are talking about functioning in the world. Arjuna is going to face many complexities in the war ahead. Arjuna has to fight against Bhishma, against Drona. Even when he understands what is, what is right, it's not going to make that easier for him to do it. He, it will just increase his conviction that he has to do it. Sometimes, uh, uh, as we practice bhakti, it's, life is tough, the world is dukkhale, and that is always going to be true. So, devotion does not make life easier, but it makes doing the right thing in life easier. There's a difference between the two. Life easier means, oh, you know, Nobody will oppose me, all my plans will work out. Doesn't that, that doesn't happen. That is what is, that is called uh, the, the word for it. Lollipop spirituality. <laughs> <laughs> so, hmm, <laughs> that, oh, I just chant some Hare Krishna and everything in my life will become easy. Hmm? So this doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So, but what it does do is, it makes doing the right thing in life easier. That Krishna, especially mentioned this late, uh, later in 1858. If you become conscious of me, you will pass <coughs> over obstacles by my grace. He's not saying obstacles will not be there, but you will be able to pass over those obstacles. So life itself will be tough. Krishna, to give a metaphor for this, say if you are in ocean, Krishna doesn't say that I will make the ocean stormless. Krishna says, I will make your ship unsinkable. 
Now, unsinkable ship does not necessarily mean it will not be hit by the waves. It does not mean that we may not struggle to steer the ship in the right direction. That will be there. And even when we are in the ship, sometimes the water will hit us also. And there will be challenges. So, it make life easier means it's like we have a stormless sea. The material world will never be like a stormless sea. But make doing the right thing easier means it's like we have the we have an unsinkable ship. It won't be destroyed, but still we have to navigate it. And over a period of time, as we become convinced that this ship is unsinkable, and then we become more and more trained at facing the waves and finding a way ahead through the waves. So this is Krishna's special mercy. Now after this, then Arjuna is very touched by hearing this. And in one sense the Bhagavad Gita ends over here. Because Arjuna will declare, Krishna you are the Supreme Lord, Param Brahma Param Dhamma. He says, I accept everything that you say. That you are the Supreme Lord. Sarva Mevat Manatmanam Vittattam Purushottam. You know everything, O oh Lord. But you know and knows. And then, while the Gita ends over here, Arjuna asks a specific question thereafter. He is, he is now clear that Krishna wants him to engage in the world, to practice spirituality in the world. That he has to not just turn away from the world, but fight the war. So then he's asking Krishna, you are told repeatedly that I should remember you. But how can I remember you while my senses are turned toward the world? <coughs> Is how can I remember you when I am looking at the objects of this world? So in which of the objects of this world can I see you? How can I see you in the objects of this world? So that is Arjuna's question. Let's look at this question. Huh? So Katham, how? Vidyam. How can I know? Aham, Yogi. So it's interesting. He is using the word Yogi here for Krishna. So what does Yoga mean? Connection. Yogi means the one who connects. He says, Krishna, I know you connect with this world. You are not just existing beyond this world. So Katham Vidyam, O Krishna, how can I know? Aham Yogi, Tvam Sada Parichintain. How can I know? How can I see you in this world? And you are saying always Sada Parichintain. So Katham Vidyam Aham Yogi. Katham Vidyam Aham Yogi. Tvam Sada Parichintain. Tvam Sada Parichintain. Then he says Keshu Keshu. In which all forms? Cha Bhavishu. In which bhava here refers to, the word bhava is also multivalent, like yoga, like karma, like dharma. Bhava is one of the words which is used for many meanings. So here bhava refers to, not emotion, the, uh, it definitely is bhavne dena, that is not the meaning here. But what it means here is manifestation. In which manifestations of it? Keshu keshu cha bhava yeshu, chintyosi, how can I contemplate you? Bhagavan maya, please tell that to me. Keshu Keshu Chabhaveshu Keshu Keshu Chabhaveshu Chintyo Si Bhagavan Maya Chintyo Si Bhagavan Maya Together Katham Vidyam Aham Yogins Vam Sada Parichintayam Keshu Keshu Chabhaveshu Chintyo Si Bhagavan Maya So here, what is Krishna doing exactly? Uh, or what is Arjuna asking? How can I remember you in this world? And Krishna gives a long list of his vibhutis. I, we won't have time to go over the list, but we'll be focusing on the principle. What is the principle always? So vibhuti. So what does it mean? V is special. Bhuta is existence or specifically manifestation. So special manifestation. Now what does the special manifestation refer to? One simple way to understand it that there is the one above the many. The one above the many is God. 
he exists above all of us and among all the people in the world that are there there is some person who is way greater the one above the many manifests as the one among the many so this is vibhuti now what does this mean that in this world there are many people there are many things but some people have extraordinary abilities there are many objects but some objects have extraordinary qualities extraordinary features and those extraordinary features catch our attention they catch our attention so when they catch our attention at that time what happens we when they catch our attention we can just get caught in them and we can lose our connection with krishna but if we understand that there the attractiveness of those things comes from krishna then those things can remind us of krishna so in the battlefield arjuna will see bhishma's military prowess he will see even duryodhan's great prowess in his fight so he will of course see bhima's great prowess fighting prowess so when he sees this prowess where is this prowess coming from it is coming from krishna so basically vibhuti means so at one level everything comes from krishna but everything doesn't catch our attention when we are going around in the in our in, our, in the world you know it's not if we there are 100 people somewhere we don't see all the 100 people right? some people catch our attention it could be various reasons maybe they are very attractive maybe they are very powerful maybe they are very loving maybe they are just a new face over there whatever it is so some things catch our attention so krishna is saying that vibhuti in one sense refers to the attention catching ability or attention catching attribute you can say that whatever attention catching attribute you see in this world that attention catching attribute comes from krishna so now in arjuna's specific cultural context uh, krishna uh, there are many attractive things and krishna lists all those things and in this way krishna says that this is how you can remember by looking at these attention catching attributes so when he understand when we understand this particular point and we can redirect our attention towards krishna let me explain this with another metaphor <coughs> say if there is an ocean a vast ocean and say if i am here now from the ocean drops have come some drops <coughs> have fallen at various places now all the drops come from the ocean but all the drops won't take us to the ocean isn't it so although all the drops come from the ocean we have to look at those drops which will take us toward the ocean and follow those drops so if we consider the ocean to be krishna then the drops are the vibhutis the attractive things in this world so everything attractive everything attractive comes from krishna that is true but everything attractive takes us to krishna that is not true so for example if somebody is extremely good looking 
Now their beauty comes from Krishna. But will beholding that beauty take us toward Krishna? Focusing on that beauty? No. But on the other hand, if we go to some go to a place like Mayapur and the deities are dressed very beautiful. We look at that. That beauty will take us towards Krishna. Now, if we are very agitated, we are disturbed by something that has happened in our life, and we go to the banks of the Ganga in Mayapur, or we go to the banks of Jamuna in Vrindavan, or we go and see, we behold the Himalayas in Rishikesh. Just seeing that magnificent natural beauty, that will calm our mind. That's also beautiful. Now, will that beauty take us away from Krishna? Unlikely. But that beauty can calm our mind and point us toward Krishna. So beauty is only one thing. There can be many things like that. So sometimes an atheist may be very clever. And they might give good arguments and use great word of jugglery. They might just have a brilliant delivery. Now we can't say it's all Maya. Yes. That ability is there in the atheist. But when we hear a devotee who is similarly brilliant, you know what happens is appreciating, we can appreciate both people's brilliance. But if we let ourselves get attracted to the atheist, it's like following that drop and going away from the ocean. We understand that the atheist's ability also comes from Krishna, the devotee's ability also comes from Krishna. But following the devotee will take us closer to Krishna. Following the atheist will take us away from Krishna. <coughs> so the idea of vibhuti is in terms of there are, so we have two sets of senses. What are the two sets of senses? Yeah. We have the jnana indriya, the knowledge senses and the work <laughs> senses. But the knowledge senses, they, they in one sense you could say they come inside. The work senses, they go outside. The, we get information from outside. And now, we can have contemplation of Krishna okay. Let's not use the word contemplation here. We can in terms of remembrance of Krishna, remembrance of Krishna, any vibhuti, so all vibhutis can serve as can serve as reminders of Krishna. I mentioned earlier when Rao, Hanuman saw Ravan in his regal opulence in his court, the first thing he thought was, hey, Ravan is such a powerful person. If only he had been virtuous, he would have been such a great devotee. He would have done such great good to the world. So in that sense, in terms of remembrance of Krishna, all vibhutis can be used as pointers, as tools to remember Krishna. But in terms of uh, remembering for reaching Krishna, it's only some vibhutis. That not all vibhutis, like I said, we see somebody good looking. If you keep remembering that, not that I mean, even, even if I remember, oh, this person's beauty comes from Krishna. But if I am remembering that person, what is happening? I will be remembering the beauty and I will forget Krishna. It is at an intellectual level, I may try to remember this beauty has come from Krishna. But at an emotional level, that we will get agitated. So what we should be remembering for reaching Krishna, that we have to select. How do we select? Anukulyasya Sankalpa Pratikulyasya Varjuna. So, we select based on we accept the what is favorable, we accept. What is unfavorable, we reject. So, for example, when we are new in bhakti, you know, at that time, it's best to focus on reading Prabhupada's books, reading Shastra, not getting caught in too many reading other things. 
we focus on learning our tradition first we learn to commit our search in tradition we learn to become convinced maybe 5 10 years 15 years down the line once we have become completely grounded then at that time we may want to share krishna with others and then we may want to learn about where others are a bit more and that time we can try to we may want to read other things also but at that time we will be sufficiently attracted to krishna sufficiently convinced about krishna that when we read about some other tradition and some other cultures we won't get we won't get, get captivated by that because everywhere there is a vibhuti of krishna in every tradition there will be some vibhuti of krishna mm-hmm. even in you could say among atheists there is some vibhuti of krishna among materialists there is some vibhuti of krishna so uh, that vibhuti should we, do we want to get attracted towards that vibhuti no so for example now if we want to build a temple for krishna Mm-hmm. say we have practiced bhakti for 10 15 years 20 years whatever i want some significant amount of now we have the responsibility we want to build a temple for krishna then we may go and look at various places which are the magnificent temples contemporary times what is their architecture now we might go to some organization and you say hey, these people have such magnificent temples you know if we are very new we may start thinking hey, there is such a magnificent temple that means you know there are so many people following it there is so much wealth if there is so much wealth so much following so much opulence so then for this is the right path i should follow this path only what will happen at that time seeing the vibhuti it is we are talking about religious vibhuti only the magnificent temple but the religious vibhuti <laughs> may take us away from krishna but once our heart is fixed in krishna then we see her these people have built such a big temple for their guru their idea of moral supreme you know this architecture is nice this is a good idea we will put it up this so then we see what is attractive and then we see how that attractive thing can be used in krishna sense so that way the attractive things i'll make two points and i'll conclude this our talk the attractive things you know they can serve two distinct purposes they can be competitors to krishna for our attention in the whole game in bhakti is fixing our mind in krishna that means directing our attention towards krishna they can be competitors to krishna or they can be pointers to krishna so now which will be which for whom that depends on the person isn't it if if you see if we go back to this earlier diagram where there is a river and the ocean now if somebody is here then this drop is going to take them away but if somebody is over here then this drop is pointing them so each one of us has to figure out what is a competitor to krishna for me and what is a pointer to krishna so somebody was good at music Maybe initially they focus on learning Krishna song, listening Krishna bhajans, and learning to sing for Krishna. Now afterwards, if they want to decide that okay, you know, I want to learn various forms of singing, which are traditional forms of singing, contemporary forms of singing, and then we can present Krishna song or Krishna music through that way. That's good. But if initially uh, every every form of singing has its attractiveness, but If we start doing it initially only, then what is going to happen? Then we will not be. We will get caught in that only, and we forget Krishna. So we have to, each one of us to decide what is anukul, what is pratikul. Say for example, nowadays there are there is rock kirtans. You see this rock mantra, and people do people use a lot of Western music for singing Krishna kirtan. Now is that good? Is that bad? well we could say any way krishna is being glorified that is good undoubtedly at the same time each person has to see what am i remembering <coughs> so for people who are already westernized whether in india or in the west for them rock is already familiar and krishna is the new thing 
But for us, Krishna will be already familiar and rock will be the new thing. <laughs> then what happens is, in the rock, rock Krishna Kirtan, we are, we are not remembering Krishna, we are remembering the rock. Then there, that, the vibhuti is there. See, every genre of music has its attractiveness, the vibhuti is there. So is that vibhuti taking me toward Krishna or is it taking me away from Krishna? That is the responsibility of each one of us. Now there are many specific, well Krishna gives a long list, but there are many specifics over here. Now when Krishna says that Pandavanam Aham, he says among the Pandavas, now you, Arjuna is expecting that he will say Yudhishthira. Yudhishthira is the eldest, the most virtuous. But Krishna says Pandavanam Aham, Dhananjaya. So I am Arjuna. Now sometimes, now what is Krishna doing is, uh, there are ways of speaking where uh, object um, is sort of equated with the person. What do I mean by that? Or rather, uh, since there is metaphorical language, or that's not, not is metaphorical. There is non-literal language. Say for example, we may tell, we may be making a phone call and the phone call breaks. And then we call the person from another phone and they say, my phone died. No, phone died? The phone was never living to die. But we are using the word died to say that mm, the battery got discharged. See, see, no? So, or for example, yesterday uh, I was talking with Achyut Mohan and I said that, you know, uh, your social media team, can it help me? He said, my social media team? I don't have any social media team. I don't have any social media team. Oh, I said, your means your temples. So sometimes when I use the word your, it can refer to the person specifically. It can also refer to the group, isn't it? So, it can say when two teams uh, are playing each other. He says, you know, so your, your batting was good. It can refer to your specific batting was good. We are talking with the captain, it can refer to your team's batting was good. So, the point is that many times when we use the word I or you, it need not be literal. It can be non-literal. Now, generally it doesn't happen with I so much, but with we it happens. Yeah. We could mean just I want two people, it could mean all of us. So, we use the word non-literally. So, many times people say that this particular chapter is talking about pantheism. Pantheism means everything is Krishna. Krishna says, oh, I am the Himalayas among the among immovable objects. Among mountains, I am Sumeru. Among rivers, I am Ganga. Among uh, animals, I am the lion. So they say this is pantheism, but it's it's is it pantheism? Pantheism, you remember in the morning I mentioned what is it? Everything. Everything is God. Now it is not pantheism for many reasons. First is Krishna is referring to specifics, not all, not everything. Isn't it? Pantheism is everything is God. Krishna is not saying all animals are me. He said among animals, I am the lion. Mrugana Mrugendro. Hmm? Now that's one thing. So it's not it's not referring to pantheism because it's clearly specifics. And then second point is it's uh, not pantheism because Krishna is it's if you look at it before and after, he is saying generally what is the meaning of a particular passage, particular section. If you want to look at it, we can look at it start and end. And both places he is saying these are my glories. He is not saying this when he is saying this. If he is all those things literally, then there is no point in saying my glories because there is what happens in pantheism, it's like God is distributed into everything and God has no separate existence. That is the idea of pantheism. So it's not pantheism. Now, sometimes some people say it's monism. Monism is impersonalism. But it's not impersonalism also. Why? 
बिकॉज वेन कृष्णा डज अर्जुना दे पांडवा नाम अहम धनंजय सो अर्जुना डज से कृष्णा इफ वी टू आर वन देन वाई डू यू टू स्पीक द गीता एंड वाई डू यू टू लिसन द गीता शट अप वी आर वन ही डज से दैट सो इट्स नॉट इन पर्सनलिज्म अर्जुना कीप्स हियरिंग द गीता सो ही अंडरस्टैंड दैट कृष्णा इज यूजिंग दैट in a particular sense krishna focuses on arjuna because while well, yudhishthir has virtue arjuna has devotion the greatest devotion is in arjuna and that's why his focus is on arjuna and then finally so this so this is this is vibhuti is a special particular by which looking at the attractive things in this world we can remember krishna and then the last verse which gives the principle Krishna starts by saying that actually I am going to tell only a few. Pradhan yatha kuru sreesta nasti anto vistar sime. That I am only speaking principal ones because there is no end to this. So, for example, in today's world, we may say that say uh, Virat Kohli is batting. That is Krishna's opinions. Or say whoever is Modi is a lock lock a locution ability. That is Krishna's opinions. or maybe who was that uh, scientist who who helped uh, the cryogenic technology develop nambi a movie was made on him he was a brilliant scientist but he was framed by america and then a lot of things happened so his scientific ability is krishna it's krishna doctors so vishwanathan's chess ability is krishna doctors so in today's world uh, whatever attracts our attention that is krishna doctrines mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. when zorinder adhant maharaj had uh, written that book journey home that time we had got endorsements for that book from different people so one of our devotees in kolkata is very well connected very elite people so he got an endorsement from saurav ganguly so then maharaj asked who is he so <laughs> <laughs> so he said in india is so famous that if you write cricketer it will be like an insult you know like a indian captain this is a famous cricketer and then bharat smiled and said if chaitanya mahaprabhu had come in this times he would have come as a cricketer <laughs> 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 so the point is whatever is attractive in this world we use it to connect with krishna so the bhuti is not just an abstract abstract philosophical concept it is a very living reality for us so krishna will talk in the last verse the principle over here yat yat whatever vibhuti mat sattvam whichever ek sattvam here doesn't refer to sattva guna sattva sattvam refers to existence whatever is in existence which has some vibhuti mat which is filled with some special attractive ability shrimad urjitam eva va it may be beauty it may be splendor it may be strength whatever is eva va So, tattad, all of this eva or the chattam or as you know, please know that mama tejo amsha sambhava that it all comes from a spark of my splendor. So, let's repeat this verse. Yad yad rib together. One of you know this. One of you know this verse. Okay, we together. विभूति and let not let me not be attracted by those drops which take me away from you let me attract be attracted to you and be attracted to those manifestations of yours which can draw me always closer to you o oh, attractive one o oh, all attractive one krishna bhagwan ki jai is there one or two questions Okay. Before we have questions, let me summarize. <coughs> Once I gave this class, and one day what he told me, 
is summarizing is your vibhuti <laughs> <laughs> so then i told him that was the time when i had forgot to give like the summary and i said prabhu it's your vibhuti that you are seeing it as my vibhuti <laughs> getting that point that you know if i can see it as krishna's vibhuti then that won't make me proud but if i see it i so i am so clever i remember everything then that same drop that same ability that krishna has given me that can take me away from krishna so if we look at we are looking today in this chapter about how krishna begins first by talking about his glory we talk about how how is the source in terms of history all beings come from him and devatas come from him in terms of qualities and if you understand that then there is that buddhi that conviction we get and conviction leads to un- non deviating undeviating avikalpena yogena concentration from that concentration will come purification and that purification will come absorption then we for a good amount of time in looking at the chatur shloki gita so this was largely 10.1 to 7 especially 10.7 then 10.8 we discussed the principle of how knowledge should lead to action to transformation and if you understand krishna's glories krishna is the source of everything that should lead us to becoming devoted to krishna so it's like if i come to know about a hidden treasure then immediately i should want to go and dig it so then we discuss about how enlightenment is both a destination and a journey now if we see it only as a destination then that can lead eventually to unhealthy unhealthy certainty which leads to fanaticism if we see it only as a journey then that leads to an unhealthy uncertainty which leads to relativism so for us enlightenment is both and we get a certain level of humility that i can never know krishna completely but at the same time there is clarity that some fundas are true it's like a ocean i am approaching the ocean from here you are approaching the ocean from here and we can both enlighten each other so enlightenment is a destination because krishna is my goal krishna is lovable krishna is my well wisher krishna always has a plan for me in that situations that conviction is my is krishna that in terms of that conviction it's a destination but journey is if i am part of krishna what is my role right now i i we always keep evolving in that understanding because the world is dynamic the world keeps changing so therefore what happens after that is we discussed krishna gives us buddhi yoga this was 10.9 then was 10.10 so buddhi yoga is what both it can be the buddhi to do yoga that with intelligence we discuss a surrender with not in normal times we surrender with our intelligence but there are times when we surrender our intelligence it's also the yoga to do buddhi so we surrender with intelligence or surrender we surrender our intelligence and then basically i don't know krishna i just want to serve you i'll absorb myself in you and then you will give me the intelligence that we discussed how when we we may all be perplexed in life we are perplexed we still try to maintain that priti purvakam krishna you must have some plan for me and if we are priti purvakam then we will get the buddhi yoga so if we have resentment that doesn't work we discuss how prabhupad worked work so hard but even when things didn't work he didn't become resentful then after that what we discussed was about 
that Krishna's guidance, Krishna's mercy can come first in terms of the clarity, but can also come in terms of the purity. That sometimes you may know what to do, but you feel I don't have the ability to do it. So we all can get the empowerment by Krishna's mercy. And those things that may not seem possible for us, they will become possible. Then the last part of the class was where we discuss Vibhuti. Vibhuti means that it is the attention catching attribute. Vibhuti can actually mean both an attention catching thing and attention catching attribute of that thing. So that thing is different from Krishna. Arjuna is different from Krishna. But the attribute of that thing, you can see it comes from Krishna, then it can be a pointer to Krishna. It can also be a competitor to Krishna for our attention. So we have to use our intelligence to explain what is, what is favorable, what is unfavorable. And accordingly, we choose, we dwell on those opulences of Krishna that which we can take our attention towards Him. So we can't always be just chanting Hare Krishna and turning away ourselves away from the world to immerse ourselves in Krishna. We also need to function in this world. So this understanding of the concept of vibhuti can help us to practice in one sense uh, engaged bhakti. Engaged means engaged in this world you can engage in this world and practice bhakti here in this world so thank you very much Hare Krishna is there any one question yes please there on the mic over there Uh, so you told that uh, um, we are part and parcel of Krishna. So we have also the part and part in the role of in the plan of the Krishna. So you told that uh, by the Vajradam Priti Purvam, Krishna will uh, give us the Vajradam Guthi Yoga. So in this way, Krishna will reveal the, our plan in his part, our part in his plan. Hmm. Is it right? Perfect, yes. So it may not happen immediately, it may take some time. It will happen in time. Yes, sir. So you told that the things which won't be possible for us will become possible. Suppose so sometimes like, uh, like we see some arrangement of Krishna, like he's directing us towards some towards something. But uh, that seems impossible for us. That so what should be our step towards it? Because we think that we are that it, it becomes sometimes so so impossible like we think we are not competent for yeah. we don't have the abilities for such a huge thing yeah so see we all have to recognize that we have limitations now we are not God so only God can do everything we can't do everything so it's a basically then something seems impossible. You know, we have to evaluate whether that feeling that it is impossible, it is based on objective considerations or subjective considerations. See, objective considerations could mean that, say, if somebody tells us, okay, you go and go in Spain and you do preaching in Spain. In Spanish. Well, I don't know Spanish right now. So right now I can't do it. So objectively there's something which you can't do. If somebody tells us do something which is just objectively not possible. Somebody tells us, say for example, do 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 two services simultaneously. And sometimes you can do we can be cleaning and maybe talking on phone with someone, counseling someone. But you know we cannot be taking two phone calls simultaneously. <laughs> so there's some things which are just objectively impossible. And that, first of all, you have to acknowledge. Now, when there is some subjective evaluation, very few things in life are actually objectively valued, but there are. Hmm? So, 
uh, no matter what I want, it's say if I had to do a program here and one hour later I had to do a program in Delhi. I can't do that. So objective factors. Then when, when it comes to subjective, there are again two things. There is our position and our disposition. Subjective means that I am saying it sub, in terms of subject it varies. So if some service is extremely important for me, then I have to learn it. Hmm. Say if, uh, if say somebody's responsibility is that they have to build a temple for Krishna. And they say, you know, I am not, I can't do fundraising. Well, then either you step down from that position, you hand that role over to someone else. Or you buckle up and get ready for this role, isn't it? You know, a mother can't have a child, a woman can't have a child and say, Oh, you know, I don't think I can be a mother. Well, you already have a child now. If you are in that position, you have to take responsibility for the position. So sometimes what may seem impossible, if our position requires it, now we may not be able to do it as well as someone else, but we have to do it. So one is based on our position. So it's this you could say it's more associated with. If we already have a responsibility, then we do it. Even in material sense, there are cases where I say if a car has fallen on a child and the mother actually gets some strength when she pushes away the car. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens. There is some strength that comes out of it. I have to save my child. Now that doesn't mean that if a whole building has fallen, the mother will push her. There are limitations. What I'm saying is that so if it's our position, then we can't just say that I can't do it. Okay, if my child is buried, if I can't do it, then I have to call someone who can do it, isn't it? So we can't just say it's impossible and give up. Now, the second is in subject to situations, we have to look at our disposition. Disposition means that how important <coughs> is something for us. In terms of our own values, in our, if something is extremely important for us, then we may try it wholeheartedly. And see, I don't feel qualified, but I have to do it. But if something we feel it's impossible and we don't even feel it's worthwhile, it's not that important. So, in terms of disposition, means how important it feels to us. So this disposition to some extent is also associated with individuals in the sense that say a Kshatriya will feel extremely bad if they are not able to protect someone physically. A Brahmana will also feel bad if somebody is being injured but a Brahmana will not feel that bad. But you can say all Kshatriyas, all Brahmanas are also not the same. So whenever there is a fight, there is need to be a fight, Yudhishthira is more like a Brahman Kshatriya. Let's try to avoid the fight as this possible. Bhima is like a Kshatriya Kshatriya. He is Kshatriya squared. He is itching for a fight. So everybody has their disposition. So some people are by nature, they are, they are stimulated by challenge. They are stimulated by risk. They are adventure seeking. And for them something impossible, yeah, I won't, I won't try it out. But some people by nature, they might be more routine seeking routine means not they want to do routine things but it's more that they want a structure they want stability they want predictability in their lives now these are just different dispositions so for them doing something impossible okay, it's just too much to do so that's okay each one of us is an individual so we all need to stretch ourselves you know these three zones there's the comfort zone Stretch zone and panic zone. So now, now, if you consider recently there was a world yoga day. So yoga is about stretching. We stretch our body and our body becomes more flexible, more nimble, more fit. But the key is in yoga, we have to stretch ourselves in a way that is comfortable. If, it, if any yoga posture becomes too uncomfortable, let's just stop it. Yoga, so similarly, each one of us has to stretch ourselves. 
but we have to stretch ourselves in a way that is comfortable if it is too uncomfortable then we will go into panic zone and then we stretch ourselves too much and somebody will have to get a stretcher for us <laughs> so that's how we deal with the what seems impossible okay so thank you very much yeah okay like uh, like when we see some patterns in which krishna is trying to say something like i ask you a question so in that also i see something that krishna is trying to say so how how do we get convicted on that path because we don't get con so much conviction that this is what he is saying like right? well yes it's it's incremental process it's very rare that somebody will have absolute conviction it doesn't matter we function in life with as much conviction as we have and we explore bhakti nath thakur says that is and sometimes we want to we go on a particular path so let's say this is not the right path we don't have to come back all the way we can turn from there go in the right direction what that means is sometimes the journey towards our goal may not be straight may be in zigzag that's okay so one 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 understanding of surrender is to do what we can with what we have now i have this much conviction so this much conviction i'll do this so do what we can with what we have now so maybe in future i'll have more maybe in future i can do more but this is what i have this is what i can do and by that we will grow okay. so online question is come okay uh, shiv ke kidding who is asking shiv ko is kidding asking hari krishna bro ji we have free will but our access to free will is limited by the modes so yes. how do we get free from the modes and take shelter of krishna seems nothing is in our hands well asking this question was in your hands isn't it <laughs> to say nothing is in our hands is a bit too extreme that yes there are many things not in our hands <coughs> but uh, we discuss this in the 14th chapter that what does krishna say when it means that we by unbreakable bhakti will go beyond the modes when it is often it, it is the modes that break our bhakti so when we discuss that the key point we mentioned was that rather than thinking of bhakti as one or zero bhakti can be at various levels it can be in terms of intention it can be in terms of emotion it can be in terms of action so sometimes our bhakti may break in terms of action it's something which is not able to do. but for there's a lapse for some time but as soon as that lapse gets over we at least try to come back to the right action if we can't at least we try to come back to the right intention so when we try to practice bhakti it is uh, say we can say unbreakable chanting uh, or unbroken chanting what does that mean now that could mean that we sat at one place and chanted hmm? it could just mean okay we walked and chanted but we chanted continuously hmm? but okay we talked with somebody else because there some other phone call came but we didn't put aside our beats as soon as we got over we talked chanted it could also unbroken chanting means it could be that you know i close my eyes and completely absorb krishna but unbroken chanting could also mean i close my eyes and my eyes stayed closed and mouth gave also became closed is <laughs> it <laughs> <laughs> well as soon as i woke up i started chanting again is <laughs> that unbroken chanting well no in one sense but still you know we didn't think okay i just go and sleep now we still got up and started chanting again so so unbroken that doesn't have to be like a one zero thing <coughs> there are different ways in can so we just like i talked about the surrender means to do what we can with what we have now so we start and with whatever mode we are in 
in that mode, we try to practice whatever connection with Krishna we can and gradually rise up. Okay. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Gaur Bhattavanda ki jai. Gaur Premanande. Thank you.